Is it my turn? So I give you one minute. Get up quick and move everything close here. 59, 58, 57. It's okay. I was ready to say, who told you to move? <laughs> okay. Now I don't have to raise my voice. So. Maricel, thank you for providing transportation and so on. I know, to everybody, yeah. So, maybe you need to move the camera closer too. Okay. So how, before we start, How do you explain when you pray and it doesn't seem to have an answer? Did it ever happen to you to pray for something, really put your heart, pray hard, and nothing happened? Did it ever happen? Okay, how do you explain it? Because the Bible says that whatever you ask in my name, it will be given to you. Is the Bible lying? No. Okay. Did you get whatever you asked? No. So how do you explain? Anybody? So I'm going to give you a quick, quick, quick answer because people struggle with that. People pray and they struggle and they look for answers and many times they don't receive an answer. I'm going to give you a quick answer. Number one. Uh, to explain theologically and then practically. Number one, theologically. It says in my name. To pray in Jesus' name is not in Hebrew to say in Jesus' name. To say the words. To pray in somebody's name when you would go somewhere in somebody's name, it meant that you are an ambassador of that person. Basically that you worked for that person represented that person and when you worked for that person you didn't do what you wanted you did only what he asked you to do only that what would be in his interest in his business if you are hired by me my ambassador you don't do what you want you do what I tell you to do because you represent me so Jesus said basically when you pray in my name you don't pray what you want you pray what would represent my interest do you understand? <coughs> to pray in Jesus' name is not to say in Jesus' name, amen. It's to pray only what would be in his interest, not what is in your interest. We, most of our prayers, I recorded prayers for about nine years. Most of our prayers are on our interest. But Jesus performed a bunch of miracles. And if you look in the Bible, all miracles that he performed he did not perform to help them. Did you hear what I said? He did not perform to help them, but he performed to save them. Basically, he didn't work for their temporary interest. He worked for their eternal interest. For instance, you pick anyone. Let's say Lazarus. Jesus didn't resurrect Lazarus, that he may live another two, three years, miserable life, persecuted, poor, and then die again. He resurrected Lazarus, People watching may have a chance to be saved. He said in prayer before doing it, Father, do this so they may know you. What was the reason for the resurrection? No. That people may have a chance to know God and his power and be saved. The man that was paralyzed, that they lowered through the roof. Jesus said, forgiven are your sins. Why didn't he say, be healed? Because he was looking for that guy's salvation, 
not for that guy healing. And they said, who do you think you are to forgive sins? You understand? Basically, they said, first is blasphemy. Secondly, we don't believe you have the power to forgive. His sins are not forgiven. And Jesus says, yeah, they are. How do you prove? Well, let me ask you, what is easier, to forgive somebody's sins or to heal somebody paralyzed? What is easier? <laughs> it seems to me from a human perspective, it's easier to forgive because you say, be forgiven, nobody can prove. But if you say be healed, you have to prove it. The guy has to walk. But for God, it's the other way around. To heal, be healed. Be still. Let there be light. And it happens. But to forgive, he would have to send his son and die on the cross. And Jesus says, I forgive him. And they say, we don't believe you have the power. And then Jesus says, listen carefully. So for you to know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive, I say, take your bed and walk. Why did he heal the man? For them to know that Jesus is God. He didn't heal the man because he wanted to heal the man. He healed the man so they would have a chance to believe in him and be saved. So Jesus was not looking to do a miracle that would help people Temporary. Paul says the sufferings of this age <clears throat> are not worthy to be even considered compared to the glory of eternity. So what does it mean? We look for now. Oh, I need my exam today. I need a car. I need a job. And God says, are you crazy? You look for a day or a year or, okay, 60 years. But there's nothing compared to eternity and eternity and millions and billions and trillions and zillions, eternity of years. And you want me to do a miracle so I solve this? When I want to do a miracle that I solve that. And Jesus says, shouldn't you forget this and focus on that and pray for that? <coughs> <coughs> Basically, his miracles were focused to save them. Our prayers are focused to help temporary help. Very self-centered. And therefore, Ellen White says, now listen carefully to this paragraph. I know the paragraph by memory. Most of them I know by memory related to prayer. Not all, but many. It says like this, to every honest prayer, an answer will come. To how many? Every. How much means that? 100%. To every honest prayer, an answer will come. If you pray with, with all your heart. But then, period, and then she continues in the same paragraph. It would be wrong to assume that God would answer the way we want in the time we want. And then she continues. God is too good to withhold anything from his children if that's for their eternal interest. Mm. Amen. If that's for their eternal interest. And then she continues and she says, if we knew the end from the beginning, we would choose the same path. Basically, she says, it would be wrong to assume that God would give you what you want in the time you want. He knows what is best for you, and he answers your prayer, but not giving what you ask, but giving what he thinks in his love and wisdom that is best for your eternity. Mm. And you think, God didn't answer my prayer. He did. He just answered in a better way. Amen. Amen. I was in school in Southern. I used to be extremely proud and extremely Stubborn, worse than a donkey. Stubborn. I would rather die my way. It was my way or the highway. And I didn't argue. The teachers in school, for instance, I was in school, in high school, I had my hands in my pockets. And the principal walked by. Goya, take your hands out of the pocket. I said, I don't want. 
I'm going to expel you out of school. I don't care. <laughs> I, I, I could not care less. I, I told him, you expel me out of school, I'm going to break your car windows. He said, you'll not do that. I said, try me. <laughs> <coughs> I was crazy. I was stubborn. I was proud. I knew that I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, and I don't care. I would take fishing line, tie on the colleague's bicycle seat, leave it like five feet long, and tie it around the tree. And then I unscrewed the wheel of the bike. They came from school and they, bang, and the wheels went and they dropped. I was crazy. I did all the time stupid stuff. And they told me, he's crazy, he'll never change. And I didn't care. And I'm not going to go through those stories. They are too many and too bad. <laughs> but when I gave my life to Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus had to start working on me. Now, do you think that that was easy? When you learn patience, how do you learn patience? Through trials. How do you purify gold? Through fire. You say, Lord, teach me patience. And then you go through trials. And you say, Lord, solve the trials. Why would you ask him to solve the trials if you ask him to give you patience and in answer he sent trials? You say, give me patience. So he gives you trials to learn patience. And then you say, solve the trials. You contradict your own prayer. <laughs> do you follow me? So you ask him to remove what he sent you in answer to your prayer. You say, Lord, solve the trials. Instead of saying, Lord, whatever you sent, I accept it. Rejoice in all things. And I say again, rejoice. In all things. You know what means in all things? Trials too. So basically, why would you ask God to solve something that he sent to begin with? Instead of asking God, Lord, I don't like trials, but you are above. You are not asleep. You are not in vacation. You are not powerless. You are in control. There is nothing without your permission. When Satan attacked Job, Satan had no power to attack Job before asking God for permission. He said, can I? God could have said no, but God said yes. Satan cannot attack you unless God says yes. If God said yes, why would you ask God to remove it? <coughs> Hello? <coughs> if God said yes, that means that you need it. Stop praying that God would solve it. Rather say, Lord, I don't like it. It's tough, but you think that I need it. So therefore, give me strength. Give me peace. Give me joy and give me trust, if you allowed it, to trust in you. And then help me learn the lessons that you are trying to teach that are necessary for my growth. That should be our prayer. And so we pray against God's will. Sure, God doesn't answer. Do you follow me? And then what we are supposed to say when we pray, Lord, help me grow. Help me learn the lessons. Not lessons that would save me, <clears throat> but lessons that would help me be a blessing for others and save others. Because that's when you are like Jesus. Jesus didn't came to, self, to save himself. If he wanted to save himself, he would have stayed in heaven. When he came, he took the greatest risk. One mistake. And he would have lost his d divinity and his eternity. Therefore, Satan focused all his power on Jesus alone like never in history. Because if Jesus would do a mistake, the whole human race would have been lost. Jesus took a great risk. He didn't come to save himself. He came to save others. He called you to do the same. Not to save you, but to give up you at any price, including salvation, eternity, and save others. Then you are like Jesus when you forget self. You go in his presence and you have problems and you forget self and you say, Lord, I do have problems, but you do know them. Doesn't he? So I'm going to trust your wisdom and your love 
I'm going to give them to you. These are my problems. Tan, tan, tan. Do whatever you want. I give you permission. And now I am asking, help me save others. Prepare me to be a tool. When you pray that prayer, Elena says, God doesn't, cannot resist that prayer. He will answer that prayer. When you stop praying for self. We are very self-centered. All our prayers are about self. So moving on. Number one, God doesn't answer prayers because we need to really pray in his name what it means to pray in his interest. That's the reason it says seek first the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean in translation to seek eternal life. I want to be in his kingdom. It means in translation seek the prosperity of his kingdom. Basically seek the advance of his kingdom. Seek that people are taken from Satan's kingdom and placed into God's kingdom so there will be more people saved because that's the reason Jesus came. He loves those people. That means to seek the kingdom. Oh, no, I, I seek salvation. Uh-uh, it doesn't mean that. It means to seek the prosperity of his kingdom. Basically, seek God's work before you seek your work. That's the reason he says, who doesn't hate himself and his job and his life and everything, it's not worth it to follow Jesus. He's not like Jesus. Ellen White has a quotation in the book called Prayer, in chapter, I don't remember, 22, 23, 24, somewhere there. And she says, when we look for our own interest, we show Satan's character. Hello? When you seek your own interest, you show Satan's character. That's pretty radical. That's pretty major. Because people, including Adventists, all Christians, when they pray, they pray for what? Self. And she says, you show Satan's character. If you want to show Christ's character, you forget self. And you seek God's interest and God's kingdom. That's the reason Jesus says that whatever you give up, he will give that to you. And whatever you seek, you will lose that. Only when Abraham, Ab Eleanor says that Abraham spoiled his son to the point that made him an idol. You get a son after a whole life, when you are old, 100 years old. Oh, tell yourself, we did You know, spoil him to death. And God said, sacrifice your son. <laughs> we don't have, how stupid Israel, they made a golden calf. Ooh, and they worshiped the calf. You got to be stupid to worship a cow. <laughs> they made it. They made it, and then they put their trust in the cow and say, save me. <laughs> we don't do that, do we? Do we? Do we? No. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> Ellen White says that we, just like them, trust the works of our own hands. Listen, we work hard our hands and build a house and we put our trust in the house. We work hard and go to school and get an education and put our trust in our jobs. Shouldn't we put our trust in God instead of jobs, homes? I am not saying that we should not have education. I'm not saying that. I am saying that whatever you put your trust in, whatever you struggle for, whatever you are stressed for, Whatever you spend time for, whatever you invest money in, that's your God. Mm. That's what you worship. So no, I worship God. No, tell me what you spend time for. Tell me what you struggle for. Tell me what you pray for. That's your God. And she says in that quotation, we trust our jobs, we trust the, hand, the work of our hands. And then she says, Whatever comes between you and God and you are not willing to surrender, that's what you worship. And then she says, for God to save us, we we'll have to give it all up. Like Abraham. Unless we give it up, we still worship idols. Did you hear? And so God asked Abraham, sacrifice your son, because his son came between him and God. 
and nothing should come between you and God. Not even family, not job, not nothing. Nothing should come between you and God. So God said, sacrifice your son. That was tough. I don't know if I would be able to do that. And when he was finally willing to sacrifice his son, God doesn't need your house. God doesn't need to take your job. He wants you to have a good life. He loves you. He's your father. He wants you to have a job. But he doesn't want you to put that job above him. Mm. So when he was willing, willing finally to sacrifice his son, God said, enough. Now I know that you love me more than your son. You don't need to sacrifice him. God didn't need to take his son. God wanted to teach him to put God first. Amen. Do you understand? And so, when you pray, you need to be willing to sacrifice everything. I'm not saying that you should not present your needs before God. You should present your needs. But, put God above those needs. Mm. Lord, this is my need. However, do what you want. My priority would be, make me a servant. Make me like Jesus. Help me know you. Help me serve you. Make me a blessing. I'm not asking that you bless me. I am asking that you make me a blessing to others. <coughs> in fact, in the Bible, if you read carefully, God never promised to bless them. He promised to bless them in order that they could bless others. He said to Abraham, I will make you a blessing to all nations. He doesn't say, I will, I will bless you. He says, I will make you a blessing to all nations. And we say, oh, bless me. And we never get it. Because God doesn't want you to be selfish. Oh, bless me, help me, heal me, ta da 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 me, 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 me. <clears throat> God wants you to focus on others to the point that you become a blessing for others. And I learned this, me and my wife. Every time we focus on self, I just read today in the morning, in the book prayer, chapter 29. I just read today. Satan gives us stress. So the more we struggle to solve our problems, the more stressed we are and the more distracted we are from God and spend more time solving our problems. And Satan will give us more problems to have what to solve. And then she says in the same paragraph, if we will take our eyes off the problems and put our eyes on Jesus and ask him to help us forget our problems and focus on serving others, then God without our efforts, would remove our problems. <laughs> In peace and serenity will be your salvation. God doesn't want you to go to war. God goes before you and he fights your battles. He wants you to go to service. Amen. He can go before you and remove the walls of Jericho. He can go before you and destroy the Amalekites. He can go before you. You follow me? He has the power. He wants you to focus on his work and let him focus on your problems. Satan wants you to focus on your problems. Do you understand? <clears throat> so therefore, number two, when you pray, God wants you to pray for others. With passion like Jesus. Lord, give me my neighbor. Give me my colleague. Give me this city or I die. I give up everything. I, I'm willing to give up my health. I'm willing to give up my job. I'm willing to give up my family. I'm willing to give up my life. Take it. But save that neighbor. He loves those prayers. When you do that, you are just like Jesus. And you make God really proud. And God says, this is my kid. I'm not going to take your life. I don't need it. I need you alive. The way you live, I just need you now. And so, do you follow me? We are afraid to say that. What if you will do it? Because we don't know him. <laughs> we don't know him. We are afraid of God. That's mysticism. We are afraid of God. God is love. God owns everything. He doesn't need to take your health or your house. He cannot use your house. 
but God wants you to be willing to give it up. Number three, when, when you pray and it seems he doesn't answer, he answers bigger than you pray, actually. For instance, in 2003, I went to Spain. And I prayed, Lord, it doesn't make sense for me to lose a whole night traveling, eat garbage food on the plane that I get diarrhea after. I get sick. That food is terrible. Get there. Stay away from my family that I love. Come back. Lose another night on the plane. Get home tired for two days and sick for nothing. If I go there and sacrifice, please let there be people in your kingdom. I want to see as many as possible. I want to see thousands because of your word through me. I want to see in heaven thousands of people saved forever. And I get those emails by God's grace, and that gives me happiness. I get those emails every day. People that write from all over the world, from Sweden, from wherever, they say, I was ready to kill myself, and I found your seminar, and I, am, I just got baptized. I never knew God, and I found your seminar, and I just got baptized. I, thousands of emails I receive. And that really makes me happy. And so I prayed, Lord, please give me source. And I preached. And nothing happened. And you're like, cold. <coughs> Nobody made a decision. Nobody was moved. Many times, most of the times, people come and say, it was for me, I sensed the Holy Spirit talking to my very need. Nobody said that. And I was kind of, I prayed and I prayed with honesty and I didn't even pray for me. I prayed for them. Why didn't you answer? And then it came in my mind, how do you know that I didn't answer? Mm. <laughs> I said, okay. And that was in 2003. And the year passed by and two and three and four and five and six and seven and I forgot about it. And this year, 2017, <laughs> how many years later? 14. 14 years later. I learned that God answered my prayer bigger than I prayed. Amen. This year, in March, I went to Czech Republic, to Prague, to meet with the European division, to do a seminar. And the guy from the European division, from Italy, Paolo Benini, comes to me and says, I'm going to put you on the spot today. I said, what have I done? <coughs> he says, just wait. And he started to talk. And he said, the church in Italy was dead. People are Catholics, but they are Catholics in the name. But they don't go to church. Churches are empty. They are secular. An old lady may go to church, but people don't go to church anymore. People are very secular. They don't even like the Pope. And he said, in the Adventist church, nobody. 20 old people, that's it. The church is dead. And he said, our church grows minus 3%. You know what that means? Going down, decline, death. And he said, we tried this program and this program and this program and nothing worked. And he says, instantly, we learned that the church in Milan exploded. Oh. Not literally. <laughs> <laughs> he said, there were 15, 16 members in Milan. All very old, dying. <laughs> 15, 16 members. And he said, instantly, they baptized 360 people. Amen. Hey, from 15 to 300, 350, 360. That's big. And you went there to see what happened. Are you crazy? How did you baptize so many? Do you give them money? Do you <laughs> threaten them with a gun? You get baptized or I shoot you. What did you do? So an old lady came to me and said, we followed this booklet. What is this booklet? She says, well, in 2003, I went to Spain to visit my kids. And there was a guy, Pavel Goya. And he gave a prayer seminar. 
and I record it with my cell phone. And I came home and I listened two, three times. And I said, I got to do this. Amen. And she said, I started to pray and I prayed for three months every morning that God would save my church. And then I listened again and I said, am I blind? In the seminar says that I should invite them to pray every morning at the church. So she invited them. They said, no. But two ladies said, yes. So now three of them prayed one day a week at the church at 5.30 a.m. What does Jesus say? Whenever 300 or whenever two or three. Sure. <laughs> That's enough. Amen. So three of them started to pray one day a week and every day at home, but one day together. Mm. After a month, they said, should we stop? And the three ladies say, we never had so many blessings in our lifetime. Our kids started to talk to us. Our kids stopped taking drugs. Our husbands start, stopped fighting. It's like our life changed since we pray. Why would we stop? <laughs> the others in the church, why are you so happy you came to the church always? <laughs> and right now you are like... <laughs> they said, well, this is what happened since we prayed. So another about 10 joined. And they said, you know what? Since we started to pray with you, things started to go good in our families. Let's pray three days a week together. Let's pray five days a week together. And they started to pray five days a week together. And they prayed a month, and they prayed two months, and they prayed three months. And after three months of prayer, nothing happened. The lady calls me in America. Well, I get... 60, 70, 80 phone calls a day. And some people talk a lot and say nothing. And I wonder, what do they want? I don't have time. I don't have time to sleep. I don't have time to leave me alone. Just say what you want. <laughs> and I say, lady, please tell me what you want. Well, we have been praying for three months, as you said, and nothing happened. I said, lady, how many times do you breathe? She said, all the time. How many months? All my life. Well, prayer is the breath of the soul. <laughs> you want to breathe three months and stop? <laughs> when you stop, you die spiritually. Ellen White says that if you stop communing with God for a second, then Satan attacks you. Prayer is a lifestyle. It's not three months. Pray forever. She said, but I got no answer. Don't pray for an answer. Pray for relationship with Jesus. Amen. Don't look for answers. Don't look for blessings. Look for God. Amen. <clears throat> and she says, you tell me that I should keep praying. Yes. I said, God bless you. Bye. <laughs> they went back to prayer. And they prayed another month. Why didn't God answer after a month? Because when God answers, he never answers more. He answers gigantic. Build an ark, save the world. Me? Are you kidding? What is an ark? It's against rain. What is rain? It never rained. God talks big. Go to my people and save them from Egypt. Really? Are you kidding? When you pray, God talks big. If God talks big and you prayed only a month, you are not ready to obey. You need to pray until God works in your life, until you are transformed, so you are ready to go in faith like crazy. If God says jump, you jump. You follow me? So God doesn't answer before you are ready. Because God has a big plan and you have a small faith. So that's the reason I tell people, keep praying. Because you need to be transformed until you are ready so God can talk. Because if he talks and you are not ready, you don't listen. You think you are crazy, you ate too much pizza. <laughs> you don't think that God is talking to you, you know. So the ladies went back to prayer and prayed another month. By now they had four months. <clears throat> and they stopped praying for, oh Lord, do a miracle. They said, Lord, we need your presence. We need to know you. We need to trust you. 
please come. One morning, a neighbor comes to them and says, what's wrong with you? You used to come once a week Saturday morning at 11 o'clock, stay one hour and go home. Now you come every morning at 5.30. What's going on? And she says, what do you pray? And the guy says, you know, what are you praying for? What do you pray for? God's presence. Have you experienced it? And they said, actually, yes. Our life has been changed. And he says, well, my wife has cancer, terminal cancer. And the doctor told her last week that she has about three months to live. Can you pray for my wife? And they said, sure. And the lady, Paolo Benini, told me that the lady told him, we prayed, but honestly, we didn't have faith. We didn't believe that she would be healed. <laughs> After two weeks, the neighbor came and said, she was healed. <coughs> we went to the doctor, and they did a medical exam, and he said, the cancer is gone. <laughs> what did you do? I says, nothing. And the guy says, all I think is about, I asked them to pray. And so the neighbor told the next neighbor, you know, my wife is healed. The next neighbor came, my kids take drugs, can you pray for my kids? And they told everybody in the neighborhood, and the whole neighborhood came, and they talked to the others, and the others came, and they talked to another block, another block. So like three, four blocks, neighborhood started to come to church. Pray for us, pray for us. And that church started to pray for the neighbors. And the more they prayed, the more things happened. And people started to tell each other and come to church and have faith. I want to be part of this church. I want to be part. 360 got baptized. Amen. Six other churches learned about it. They started to pray. And six other churches exploded. So Paolo Benini told the story of the division. And so I learned in 2017 that my prayer from 2003 was answered. <laughs> do, you, do, you un do you understand? Yes. You say, oh, God, you didn't answer my prayer. How do you know? Keep praying and serving. Answer is not your business. Answer is God's business. Amen. Praying and serving is your business. Do your job. And let God do his job. Do you understand? I got a phone call from a guy. His name is Fanny. That's his name, Fanny. <laughs> <coughs> Literally. And his wife is Dana. And they live in Italy, in Turin. And he calls me. And I get so many phone calls that sometimes I'm not very nice. He calls me and says, I started to pray the way you say, and nothing happens. I said, what do you want to happen? You want the roof to fall on you or what? <laughs> and he says, well, I was expecting a miracle. I said, well, Pharisees asked for a miracle. Didn't they? Yes. Jesus didn't use miracles except to save people. Not to prove that he is God, not to, you know. I said, stop asking for miracles. You better seek God. Don't seek the blessings, seek the, seek the blesser. And he says, well, uh, so what's the purpose of prayer? I said, I just told you, don't listen. He said, okay. And I said, bye, I'm busy. started to pray. A month later, he called me again. You remember me? I said, no, I get 70 phone calls a day, every day, and about another 70 to 100 emails a day. Like two days ago, the night before I checked all the emails, in the morning I had 61. You remember? 61 emails in one night. Crazy. <laughs> Not in 24 hours, only in one night. Half of the day. Anyway, and so, I said, how could I remember you? Well, I called you and I said, yeah, many people called me. And you told me to pray. I tell that to everybody. <laughs> and he says, well, I've been praying for a month with my wife and nothing happened. How long should I pray? One hour? And for a month each day, one hour? I said, man, do you love God? Yes. I said, no, you don't. 
He says, oh, yes, I do. I said, no, you don't. Do you love your wife? Yes. When you're dating your wife, did you ask her, how long do you want me to spend with you? One hour for three months every morning? <laughs> That's the wrong question to ask. <laughs> if you really love her, you know how long do you want to spend with her? All the time. I said, you tell me you love Jesus and you say, how long should I spend with him? He was, he was quiet. I said, are you there? Yes, I am. I said, okay, you got the message. Bye. <laughs> <coughs> he started to pray, Lord, help me love you. To the point that I desire you more than anything else. More than anything else. More than help, more than job, more than life, more than miracles, more than answers, more than anything else. Help me. God loves that prayer. Lord, I want to see you like Moses, like David. Lord, I want to see you. I want to know you. Show me your face. Let me know you. He started to pray for a knowledge of God. He called me again one month later. He says, you know, since I stopped asking for blessings. I says, I do have needs. And I do present them before God. I listen to your prayer seminar. I do present them, but I make God a priority above my needs. And I say, Lord, do whatever you want to me, if that would help me know you. Mm. And he said, God started to talk to me, and I started to distinguish his voice in my mind. And every time I listen, things go amazing. And every time I don't listen, I'm really sorry after because things go down. And he started, he said, I started to walk with God and see God's hand every step, every day, in every small thing. I, I got used to walk with God. And he says, this is beautiful. I said, this is nothing, buddy. He says, what? He said, this is the beginning. You keep doing that and it's going to be bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. He says, wow. I said, yeah. God has no limits. We limit him. <laughs> he said, okay. He called me again one month later. He says, it's too much. I cannot handle. I said, what do you mean? Well, I have a business. And I, that helps me pay my bills. Pay the house, pay the telephone, pay electricity, pay food. God just asked me today in the morning in prayer, me and my wife, we prayed separately, and she came to me, and she says, God impressed me something really big. And I said, God impressed me something really big too. She said, what? To give up our business. And she said, me too. He said, God impressed me to give up my job. How am I going to live? How am I going to pay the bills? I said, buddy, why do you ask me? Did I tell you to give up your job? God told you, go and ask him. He says, yeah, but you told me to pray. I said, I'm sorry that I told you to pray. <laughs> what do you want me? To tell you not to pray? <laughs> he said, what should I do? I said, ask him. Go back to prayer. When you don't have trouble, you ask him. He gives you trouble. When you have trouble, you ask him. He takes the trouble away. Go back to him. He's not going to give you more than you can handle. When he gives you the trouble, he gives you the means to get out of it. Go back to prayer. He said, okay. He prayed, he called me again. I said, if everybody called me as many times as you call me, I'll never sleep. <laughs> he says, well, God told me to actually trust in him with my business and go and help poor countries. He says, but I am too small to help poor countries. How could I help a country? I said, listen carefully. When God calls you to do something, Jesus says, go and I will be with you. Basically, he says, you go in my power and all authority has been given to me, heaven and earth. When you go in Jesus' power, why are you afraid? If God sent you and you say, I cannot help a country, is because you look to you. Like Israel, we cannot go in Canaan. They are big and they are small. They have an army we don't. It's because you look to you and you look to the problems. When God sent you, 
You look to God. Who helped you in the past? Who gave you water from the rock? Who gave you bread from heaven? Who split the sea for you? Who, do you follow me? He is able to give you victory over Canaan. We have nothing to fear unless we shall forget how God has led us in the past. And I told him, stop looking to you. You don't have the power to help a country. But God has the power to help a whole country. Mm. He said, I got it. I go. He said, you must be crazy to do what God said. I said, absolutely. He says, am I right? I said, absolutely. <laughs> when God asked me to go to America, everybody that I know, family, friends, told me that I am crazy. But the Bible says that God's wisdom is foolishness for people. And people's wisdom is foolishness for God. You need to be crazy to obey God in the human wisdom. You follow me? So I said, obey him. Do the crazy stuff. Wasn't it crazy for Gideon to go to war without a sword, with a light and a trumpet? Wasn't it crazy for Jehoshaphat to go to war and put the choir in the front line? Imagine if you sang soprano. <laughs> Wasn't it crazy to go around Jericho and just walk, they could have thrown rocks from the wall <laughs> and arrows. It's crazy what God tells you to do. Take the handle of the axe and throw it on the water. Why? Do you understand? Amen. Go and take a bath in the Jordan. Why? doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. But when you obey God, you don't obey by logic. That's science. You obey by faith. That's craziness. <laughs> so I told him, I said, yes, you got it. You need to be crazy. <laughs> he said, I will. He talked to, to the church in Turin. He rented three big trucks. Those long 18-wheelers, trucks. He rented three trucks, talked to the church, filled them with help for the poor, clothing, talked to three families, friends, one family driving one truck, three families driving three trucks, and they left to go to Ukraine during the war in Ukraine to give them to the people that lost their homes, to give them clothing, because it was during the winter. They drove from Italy to Ukraine two days and two nights. When they got to the border of Ukraine, the captain at the customs said, no, I cannot let you go. You need to pay customs. You need to pay toll. And you are allowed to take two suitcases per person, and for everything else, you pay two dollars and forty two euros and forty cents per pound. Three eighteen wheelers to pay per pound? <laughs> That's a treasure. <laughs> he says, I don't have that type of money. Then we can not let you go. They went back in the eighteen wheelers and they prayed, Lord, please help us to go through the customs without paying. Please, please, please. They went back and the guy said, No. They were like, please, Lord, please. He called me, I am at the border of Ukraine, and I cannot go to. I said, did I send you to Ukraine? No. <laughs> they leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> Who sent you to Ukraine? God. Go back to God. I did. He didn't answer. I said, buddy, to every honest prayer, an answer will come. It may not come the way you want in the time you want, but God will answer better than you ask. That if you knew the end from the beginning, you would choose the same answer. You just need to trust God because that's faith. Not when you understand. That's science. When you don't understand, that's faith. Put your eyes on God. Don't put your eyes on the problem. How easy for you? I said, no, it's not easy. You don't know my life. He devised a plan. That's what we do. 
When we think God didn't work, we help God because God is so weak, he needs our help. <laughs> like Abraham, I'm going to sleep with my servant and help God have a baby. <laughs> he made a mess. For generations, those two babies fight. God didn't need his help. God gave him a son. God doesn't need your help. Amen. My friend devised a plan to help God. Put 200 euros in the passport, went back to the captain and said, check my passport. Like a bribe. Uh. The captain opened, he said, hey, I would love to take the money. That's a lot of money. It's like six months my salary. But if I do that, I lose my freedom. He said, if you try this again, you get in trouble. Go away. <coughs> so bribe didn't work. And so they prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And they spent one day and one night praying. And the captain said, no. <laughs> and they got discouraged, badly discouraged. They looked for a storage place. They unloaded the tree trucks in three storage rooms. They paid storage. He called the local pastor from Ukraine over the border. He said, hey, I brought stuff for your church to give to the poor. This is the combination of the lacks. Go and get it. And they left back discouraged. And he thought nothing happened. And he stopped praying. Six months later, he got a phone call from the pastor. He says, you know what happened? He says, I don't know. God didn't answer my prayer. I gave up praying. He says, you don't know what happened? No, I don't know. Oh, let me tell you what happened. What happened? I took six elderly people because they were retired. The others go to work. But retired people have time. And we crossed the border, went to the storage, and took two suitcases each. Six elderly plus the pastor, seven. Two suitcases each, it's 14 suitcases. And you are allowed to go two suitcases per person without paying customs. We crossed with 14. Next day, we crossed with 14. <laughs> Next day, we crossed with 14. And the captain says, it's going to take you forever to the end of the world to empty three big trailers. Long 18 wheelers, seven suitcases at a time. He says, how much money do you make from selling this stuff? And the pastor says, you got it wrong. We don't sell it. We give it to the poor people from the war. And the captain says, I don't trust you. Nothing is for free in our society. Everybody has a, an agenda. Everybody wants to make a, a buck. Everybody wants money. Uh, you lie. You have a business, you sell it. And the pastor says, no, we want to be like Jesus. We give it to the poor. And the captain says, if there was a religion like that, that they really do that, I would join them. But no religion does that. They, what they do, they just, they look for profit. They look for people's money. And the, the, the pastor says, no, let me explain you what we believe. And he told him a little about Jesus' love. Next day, the captain said, okay, you told me about God's love. That's too nice to be true. What happened to people if they die in war? And the pastor told him about the state of the dead and about the resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> Next day, he said, when is Jesus coming again? And the pastor told him about second coming. <laughs> Next day, there were six more soldiers that joined the Bible study. Next day, there were altogether 11 soldiers plus the captain. Next day, there were about 16 soldiers plus the captain. After three months, he gave them 28 Bible studies. Because he didn't go every day. There was Sabbath and Sunday and da-da-da. He didn't go every day. But the captain said, when do you come again? Because I have more questions. <laughs> After about three months, 11 soldiers and the captain got baptized. Amen. And he said, you know what? You don't have to take two suitcases a day. Just come with trucks and take everything. <laughs> and he called Fanny and said, you know, 12 people together got baptized. If God allowed you to cross the border 
none of them would have been saved. Was his prayer answered? He called me, you know, my prayer was answered. I said, I don't have time, I'm, tell me the story. Just, he said, no, no, no. I said, you see, you told me that God didn't answer your prayer and you don't want to pray. Are our prayers answered? We want it now. God has a, bitter, a bigger answer than what you pray. But there are conditions. And I just talked about them. I went through them. Do you understand? But we are so self-centered. Instead of seeking God's agenda, we seek our agenda. And then we have no patience. And then we don't allow God to work the way he wants. And so on and so forth. How much could God accomplish if all his children would pray that way? When you start praying, he would start working. First, that's the reason he told them, don't go, wait in the city and pray until you receive power. God wanted to prepare them because they were fighting, they were selfish, they were looking for positions. Ellen White has a quotation. In thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. And she says, looking for position, for power, for influence, and for self-gratification is from Satan. Jesus came to serve. He humbled himself to death. So when you start praying, God starts working on you. He says, wait, don't go. You are not ready. You will go and not save anybody. Wait. And God starts working on you until the disciples were humble, and they were loving, and they were one, united, then the Holy Spirit came. You understand? You start praying, God starts working. And when you are ready, you receive the power. When you receive power, big things happen. That's what we need. Okay. I, I had a sermon prepared for tonight. When I talked to Jen, he told me four different places. I said, okay. So I took four good sermons. I never get to preach my sermons. I just tell stories. <laughs> okay, folks. <clears throat> my voice is not very good. Last night, I had, I, the echo, echo and everything was kind of forced me to talk loud. And then I didn't sleep too much last night. I'm tired. So we stop. Let's pray. Do you have questions? Good, you don't. <laughs> Take one minute and pray privately, and then I have a closing prayer. Father in heaven, <coughs> please help us to know you, to seek you more than anything else, to make you a priority, to love you more than anything else, to seek the prosperity of your kingdom above the other things and to believe that the other things will be provided, to know you and to trust in you, to understand that we first need to seek your plan and then to pray big prayers because you are a big God. Amen. And then to wait upon you because you do answer, but you answer in your time, in your way, better than what we pray, better than what we even think. <coughs> Help us know you. Help these children, Father. I know they are not all children, but please help them to experience you like never before. And Father, you can do anything. You have no limits. We pray for these schools and we pray for this place. 
Help them put the, their eyes on you and start revival here. And may it spread all over and may people be saved. We believe that you answer this prayer because of your grace, not because of us. We pray in Jesus' name, according to his will and in his name. And thank you in faith, Lord. We love you and we praise you. Amen. Amen. <coughs> <coughs>